Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, everyone. Wonderful to have you all here. I know you had your choice of sessions to go to this morning. You chose wisely. This is uh, the session you want to be at, I can tell you, because uh, um, we talked about yesterday, for those who were at the opening session, in the end, that was driving my panelists to come up with solutions to make the world a better place. I see esteemed panelists who were participants uh, yesterday, and the individuals, the gentlemen that we will hear from uh, in just a moment, all those individuals who are making the world a better place, those who will and are contributing to a more so social cohesion amongst uh, this planet. Therefore, I am delighted to hear from them about the role of philanthropy in the new world order, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, with your very active participation, the room is designed, so this is not a panel per se, but rather an intimate discussion amongst all of us. Up first, um, I'll be delighted to hear from him. He is a French businessman who established the Brazzaville Foundation. It's a foundation which intends to address economic and environmental problems in Africa. First up, to tell us about his foundation and his uh, drive, if you will, his motivation uh, that drives him uh, in his work uh, pertaining to the foundations is Jean-Yves Olivier. Jean-Yves Olivier, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, three, uh, three and a half years ago, I decided to, to set up uh, the foundation which is called Brazzaville. Brazzaville comes from the name of an accord which has led the, the release of Mandela and the end of apartheid and where I, I did play a modest role. Uh, why I've done the foundation? Because in the world of today, is uh, the work I used to do, which was behind the scene, on the shade, is not possible anymore. And you have to be totally transparent. The, in the Google days, you cannot really do things which is not known or appreciated or commented. So I decided to set up this foundation, which has two, two objectives. One is peace resolution of conflict, and the other one has to do with uh, better be for the people, including the environment problems. So far, we have been able to achieve some, some success. Uh, one is uh, uh, we have uh, initiated and uh, put together a fund which is uh, meant to uh, uh, protect and develop the bench of the Congo River. 14 countries have signed this fund. Now it's, not, it's already going on and uh, I am just the ambassador of the fund. Uh, and the second thing we are trying to do now is to tackle the problem of fake medicines, which is a plague in uh, the world and especially in Africa. Uh, we are also uh, involved in uh, trying to help a solution in Libya. That's our present activities. Thank you so much for illustrating and pointing out the good work that your foundation is doing to make a difference, in particularly in Africa. We will talk, of course, more. We'll come back to you uh, in, in finding out why you decided to engage uh, and, and uh, perhaps also dispense some advice that you might have for government officials and the private sector. But second up, uh, he's a South African social entrepreneur and philanthropist. He's the founder of the Ishikovitz Family Foundation. And for those who might not be familiar with the foundation, I'm sure he will now explain what it does. Ivor Ishokovitz, you have the floor. This truly is the African century. Um, I have uh, had the privilege to have been brought up in South Africa and to have lived through um, the tumultuous years that led up to the negotiated settlement and the rise of democracy in 1994. And I consider myself to have been um, a, a witness to a, a new world order in the South African continent, uh, or South Africa and the African continent. And I consider the experience that I had to have been a great, great privilege, um, not a privilege that many people get to have. And 
I realized that the experience that I had was an experience that shaped everything that I did in my business, in my social interactions, in my work around the world, and that there were many, many learnings that had come from the transition in South Africa that needed to be captured for future generations. And um, our, our family um, has been active in, in South Africa for more than 100 years in many, many different activities and many different uh, philanthropic activities. But we decided to pull these all together into a foundation that focused on very similar things to what the DOC does. The transition in South Africa was about dialogue. It was about human beings finding each other at a very special time in history and resolving problems through human interaction. And the first uh, component we set up in our foundation was the African Oral History Archive. And the idea was to capture the original testimony from the people that had been involved in the struggle and to hear their stories. The truth is that history gets rewritten by the victors. And it's very, you know, with modern technology, it's very easy now to be able to create a body of work that doesn't allow people to rewrite history. And the African Oral History Archive created this four and a half thousand hours of interviews with people who had actually been involved in the struggle and in the transformation. Um, from, from Nelson Mandela to Kurt Waldheim to Jean-Yves Olivier to... Uh, um, everybody from every side. We had Cubans and Russians and Americans and ANC politicians and guerrillas and arms smugglers and everybody who was involved tell their story. So today, the African Oral History Archive is making this information available to academics to be able to extract the learnings of the transformation process. So that's one of the, the elements of our foundation. The other, the other um, key focus of the foundation relates to conservation. Um, and not only to conservation, but the, 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 the effects of poaching on the economies of Africa. Um, we realized very early on that the future of the African continent depended on our ability to create security. Um, and in my day job, we run an aerospace and defense uh, um, business, which is a global business, but where we come face to face with conflict all over the world. And we realized that a lot of this conflict was created by the proceeds of cross-border crime, including the trading in contraband wildlife products. So, albeit that we're very involved in saving rhinos and saving elephants and saving pangolins, we don't approach this from a green perspective. We rather approach it from the perspective of stopping the trade, which ultimately funds the purchase of weapons, which um, create hotspots on the continent and affect our, our growth and development. And, and this is a very big focus of ours. We employ a lot of resources, a lot of funds, in, to create sustainable anti-poaching operations. We learned a long time ago that sustainability had to do with creating competence rather than just throwing money. The foundation is also involved in good citizenship programs. We ran a program um, in South Africa called um, I Am Constitution, where we brought South Africans into direct con contact with their constitution. We found that most South Africans didn't actually even know that the Constitution existed, didn't know what we'd fought for, didn't know what our struggle was about. So we set up a huge program which has been extremely successful to bring people in direct contact with, uh, with, with, with the Constitution. Um, and there are many other aspects to the, to the uh, foundation. We have an art archive and a whole lot of other activities. What we're trying to do is to make Africa a better place and to give Africa an opportunity to play a real serious role in what is turning out to be a very interesting new world order. Make Africa a better place. Certainly you are doing it. Your foundation is doing it. Many thanks for highlighting uh, the many good work that your foundation is doing on the ground and the community engagement uh, that you and I believe your forefathers, your, uh, your, your family has been involved in for many, many decades. We're moving, we're shifting continents now off to Asia. The gentleman leads both the sales, marketing, logistics, and distribution arm of the Sekar Group uh, through the Indonesian Food Network. Pangan Vestari, Ivi Sumbada, you're up next. Thank you, Ali. Yeah. Um, so I'm here uh, representing our chairman, Mr. Harry Susilo. 
He is the eldest of uh, 12 siblings, and his father had a stroke when he was still young, so he has a moral obligation to work and be able to provide the family for a better life. So that's why he founded Sakar Group. From a humble beginning of uh, exporting uh, seafood products from Indonesia into uh, Hong Kong and Singapore by air freight back in 1966, it is now, uh, today, it is grown into uh, a network of um, a, a, a business interest that is in um, vertically integrated uh, stream uh, and then um, consumer goods as well as mining and property. So he has a strong belief that um, to have a sustainable legacy in family business, we have to have ethics. With good ethics from the family member, family business can attract good professional managers. With good ethics as a foundation, we believe that family business can be sustainable beyond the third generations. So during his retirement time, he founded Susilo Institute of Ethics in Global Economy that worked together with Boston University to advance uh, the research of ethics that is based on the West and the East values. Cooperation with the top universities in Asia, such as Tsinghua University, will ensure that this institute will accommodate the thoughts of liberal values of the West, as well as the ancient wisdom of the East. The research uh, results will be used as a foundation for ethic classes taught as a mandatory uh, subject in Boston University. So um, the whole purpose of the Susilo Institute is to uh, ensure that the next generation will have a good uh, ethical foundation on top of whatever specific um, subject they are studying in the university. Thank you. Thank you, Evie. Thank you for highlighting uh, the work that uh, the Sekar Group is doing in Indonesia. Much appreciated. Now up to uh, India. He's the Chief Program Director at Tata Trust, a philanthropic organization in India, and he will tell you all about what kind of work it entails. Pavitra Kumar. Thanks, Ali. Um, many of you must be knowing Tata Group, uh, uh, which is a commercial body uh, worldwide, uh, it's having operations. The organization that is behind this Tata group is the Tata Trust. The philanthropic body, which is the oldest body established by the four founding fathers way back, 150 years back. So the 66 to thirds percentage of the stock of that Tata group is owned by the Tata Trust. And the regular philanthropic work is being done through the dividend income that comes from the commercial operations and that will be spent on the communities. That is the basic underlying principle is what we get from the society should be given back to the society. That is the underlying principle which our founding fathers decided to start as a group. So it all started in, um, um, in way back in 1890s where uh, Jamshedji Tata, who is a founding father of uh, the Tata group, um, has a, always a thought in his mind to create a nation building. Because at that time, under the colonial reason, there is a lot of uh, 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 underdevelopment, poverty, no, uh, malnutrition, uh, everything, all problems are there. So looking at the, all those aspects, the founding father thought nation building is our main target. Towards that end, the del, uh, as activities have been taken in two st shapes. One is the how, uh, how st all the stakeholder management can be done through an industrialization. Second thing is how the uh, technical and uh, capable manpower resources are available within India. With this two-pronged approach, they started the uh, creation of uh, many industrial uh, entities within India. Those entities, means uh, you can uh, name it, many of the founding Tata Steel, Tata Chemicals, Tata 
um, motors, many of the entities. When they started uh, doing that kind of activity, the stakeholder management, that is looking after the employee safety, workman compensation, provident fund, all those aspects, which are very much essential for the employee well-being, we've been thought through at the early stages of 1890 itself. So that kind of a thought has been slowly been uh, implemented across all the Tata Group entities. Thereafter, he started about the second uh, approach of uh, creation of a Jain Tata Endowment Group, which is a trust means supporting various uh, uh, development, uh, educational scholarship for the uh, poor and needy. But the thought behind of starting this is to support the the talented but not having the right financial support to further study. So that kind of activity has been undertaken and many of the India's greatest leaders are now uh, the, uh, having the honor of a part of the JN Tata Endowment Scholarship Program. So this is how we started the journey. Thank you so much, Pavitra, for your remarks regarding Tata. Indeed, very important work that you do. We heard yesterday from Alphonse uh, on the panel uh, during the opening session the many challenges that India is still facing for those who have been left behind, still trying to catch up with the economic developments of your country, and your trust certainly plays a huge role here. Thank you so much for that. Last but certainly not least, he's of course a very well-known uh, businessman, Russian-Armenian businessman and social entrepreneur. He's involved in numerous charities, and he's also the founder of the Aurora Prize for Awakening Humanity, which, by the way, will start next uh, Monday. Ruben Vardanyan. Ruben, you're up. Thank you, Ali. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> uh, I will try to be very brief and um, a little bit provocative about what I'm doing. I'm not a pure philanthropist. And we started doing this last uh, already 20 years, something which is, we name is very different. It's not social impact investment, but it's a um, holistic approach where we combine commercial, social impact, and philanthropic project under one big vision. Because one thing we believe, you cannot solve one problem because you're solving one problem getting to other problems. For example, the plastic bottles 30 years ago when I was young, I, believe, I remember very well everybody said, oh, it's a solution for the pe poor people to get water cheaper. But at least now we're trying to solve the, how the plastic will be utilized. So what we're trying to do uh, last 20 years in the three areas, projects which they all link to each other, in education, in sustainable development, and immigration, because we believe only this way we can really keep the most uh, bright people in their own countries in the emerging market and try to decrease the gap between the um, <clears throat> emerging markets and developed world. We're also doing differently with from the private-public partnership. It's not the public-private partnership, it's a private-public partnership because our project is very unusual. We are doing not from gr grassroots, bottom to up, small projects or Top down, we're doing anchor big projects, very ambitious projects, which really transforming the societies or regions. And this is why, for many time, for many governments, it's impossible to support with our project and be leading this project. They can support without, but they cannot lead this project. And this is why we're doing the private-public partnership in, and we are engaging a lot of other people's money. This is also a very unusual element. We are raising money from others. From 1.3 billion dollars, which we invest during the last 20 years, it's a 300 million dollars came from our family. Other money came from other people, which is, I feel, say it's a very important element of success. Um, I won't say also we've been doing this anchor projects in a way, but this is a little bit best. It's not usually when you're doing philanthropy, you're trying to go from bad to normal. And this is one of the biggest challenges because being, becoming normal means you always been being late and you cannot never catch the gap. What we're trying to do, we're trying to do really uh, get, uh, jumping from bad to best. Uh, I will bring you one example because I don't, we don't have too much time, but happy to talk about more about this. And uh, it's, um, for example, in monastery in Armenia, which is, uh, Armenia is very proud to be first Christian country with a great lot of monasteries. One of the most rural area in outside of Yerevan, which is the capital of Armenia, four or five hours drive, no roads, nine villages dying, unemployment, horrible uh, situation. 
um, no tourists, less than 4,000 tourists was going this place because of the so far from capital. It was a great monastery. Normally you're doing, okay, let's do reconstruction, renovation of the monastery, which was destroyed by earthquake, but okay, who will come? It's only 4,000 people. EU was spending money to training to teach the farmers to do bed and breakfast, but was no tourist. Again, it was no, it's just wasting money. What we did, we built the longest cable car by a Swiss company, Doppelmar Garaventa, to bring people from one part of the gorge to this monastery. What's happened, it was pure <coughs> social impact project because it was not uh, being, paying back to the big invest, uh, the investors, only in 20 years time maybe. The difference now, we got 150,000 people coming to this place. We got 27 hotels and restaurants opened by local people. We got $200,000 sales of souvenirs with people been selling because of this uh, cable car. It's why it's a, not just one project has a social impact element. It's a pure philanthropic project, renovation of a monastery, social impact project about building the cable car, and commercial projects now become valuable for the people to work around this monastery and cable car. This is the concept of trying to organize many other areas. Thank you. Many areas indeed. Thank you so much and good luck with the Aurora Week starting next week. I know it's going to be a wonderful occasion and event as always. Before I open up, we have a packed room here which shows uh, the importance actually and the great interest in this particular subject matter that people have in philanthropy and having such outstanding individuals here on stage who can speak with great deal of expertise. Of course, I want to give uh, the audience, the participants here, the opportunity to address you directly to ask you directly questions that they might have but before I do Jean, um, Jean-Yves Olivier I want to ask you the role of philanthropy in the new world order is the title of this session and we we heard yesterday that of course uh, the, the new world order is is going to be looking very different uh, it's going to be a very different world in the 21st century what role can philanthropy play here if, particularly in regards if you look at vis-a-vis -vis governments and private sector. What particular specific role can philanthropy, should philanthropy play that governments and private sector cannot? Philanthropy will permit things to happen where normal uh, government organization, uh, state organization, because of the bureaucracy, because of the inability to express uh, uh, real dialogues, cannot do. I think this is the role of philanthropy. Philanthropy is to fill up a gap, which is, besides the, uh, the general approach, is to uh, uh, have a direct approach and without any, any no constraint and no uh, rules to follow. I want to uh, pass on the, the question also to Ivor, of course, whose family has been engaged in philanthropy for many, many uh, years and decades. Ivor, if, if particularly you saw it, well, this is the African century. Perhaps you can frame philanthropy in, in the African context for us. So Africa um, presents a very unique set of circumstances. It's, it's, it's interesting, when you speak to most philanthropists, they're their dream is to have an African project because you know, we've designed ourselves over many years to have people feel sorry for us. And some of the biggest challenges in Africa have actually been caused by philanthropy. Some of the biggest challenges in Africa have actually been caused by the new world order that was created after World War II because you had all of these NGOs that were um, UN sponsored, that were internationally sponsored, that needed a cause. And Africa was a phenomenal cause because look, there are all these poor children that are running around the streets without clothes and without shoes. And this was the image that Africa created for itself. And you know, we've experienced a new world order in Africa much sooner than the rest of the world has experienced a new world order because the scale of the challenges in Africa were just so huge that government realized, governments realized very early on that they couldn't fix all these problems themselves. Um, and the role of philanthropy in Africa today is about actually getting stuff done on the ground. And there are two kinds of philanthropies in Africa. There's the industrialized philanthropy, which is all about raising money in the West and in the East and elsewhere 
to run massive organizations that deploy very little money on the ground. And we're fighting against that every single day. The concept of industrial philanthropy that is just in the business of raising money against uh, propaganda, because often the causes that they support are not real causes to start with, or if they are real causes, they're created causes, um, has got to stop. Because the hundreds of millions of dollars that are raised around the world are not necessarily finding their um, place on the ground. And what we, where, where I see the, the, the role of the new style of philanthropy is to get businesses to actually have a social impact. We, we do not consider what we do to be in the business of donating anything. We're not in the business of raising money to give people anything. We're in the business of capacitating, creating, sharing ideas, making what we do sustainable on the ground. And we, 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 we're fighting very hard to get other agencies, other sources of capital, companies, to be focused on social impact in Africa. And I think that the key is about issue, action, out. Getting stuff done on the ground. Is the concept of philanthropy understood and practiced widely in South Africa? I think that the concept of philanthropy is practiced widely all over Africa. The concept of Ubuntu, the concept of neighborliness, is a very, very strong social concept right throughout the, concept, uh, the, the continent. Um, the, the word Ubuntu has many other words in many other African languages. Um, it, the, 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 the philosophy is that I am because of those around me and that somebody, you know, the village is one's home. And therefore, what we call structured philanthropy has been practiced in Africa throughout society for centuries and centuries and centuries. In fact, I would go as far as to suggest that probably Africa is the home of philanthropy because everybody feels responsible for everybody else. I think the challenge is trying to give it structure, to trying to, 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 to talk about African philanthropy in Western terms. And I think that there just isn't the language to do it. Before I move on to uh, Evie, I, Jean Yves Olivier, let me also ask you the question whether the, the concept and role of philanthropy is properly and sufficiently understood and practiced widely in France. I cannot speak for the French. I mean, uh, I am French myself, but my my foundation is in England. So, so, well, let's, so talk, uh, let's talk about the English then. Uh, uh, I, I choose I choose UK for very specific reasons. Uh, but uh, I, you see, at the end of the day, you are trying to create the uh, through, uh, philanthropy uh, mechanism a platform. In fact, you are building your own house and you are starting to welcome people in this house. Uh, and, this is, and this is, I think, the good thing about philanthropy is, is the, you, you are able to share and also participate. And uh, I think this is a very positive aspect of philanthropy. Evie, how, do how does your uh, CEO of the SECA group, how, how, do you, how would you define the role of philanthropy in the 21st century? Uh, what role can, what role should philanthropy play? Um, I think as a philanthropy, uh, uh, I like the idea of uh, Ivor uh, when he's trying to say that, you know, don't give the fish, instead just give the, uh, fishing, uh, the fish rods and all the equipment. So. So I think uh, it is very important for philanthropists all over uh, uh, the world uh, to actually uh, attack the main problem as opposed to just giving and giving and giving. So I think equipping, e equipping the, uh, uh, the people rather than giving would be the, the idea of the 21st century. I think it's fair to say, would you say it's fair to say that there's uh, big wealth income uh, inequality in Indonesia, uh, therefore, uh, are the more affluent uh, aspects and portions of Indonesian society, are they engaged in philanthropy? Is this something that is, that is understood, that is practiced? Uh, yes, uh, uh, more, uh, more and more uh, these days, uh, uh, the, the CSR is being um, basically uh, implemented in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is not only to just give, but also uh, people will come to the ground 
and, and, and see their money in action, basically. So it's an increasing trend that we're seeing, uh, philanthropy uh, being implemented in action in Indonesia, Pavitra. Let, let's talk about India here, Tata Trust. Again, uh, some of the things the government cannot do, uh, we, we just heard from, from Ivor, that, that government's funds, uh, abilities are limited uh, when it comes to uh, public engagement. How, how about, how about uh, philanthropies here, the role of philanthropy in India in the 21st century? If you look at it, uh, the philanthropy from Indian perspective or whatever, wherever it is uh, located, the main uh, objective or the chapter under which the where philanthropy starts its operations, but it cannot uh, uh, remain at that point of place. It should continuously evolve itself. So we started the journey with the scholarship provision to the bright young, young and talented uh, students. But over a period of time, we moved from there, and we are into the uh, areas where we never thought about, like we are now in the uh, health, education, sanitation, hygiene, uh, livelihood, digital, uh, digital interventions, that are the new concepts. That also we are uh, continuously coming into the requirement. So wherever the society needs some kind of a support, which government or other uh, mainline uh, uh, bodies cannot serve the requirement. The philanthropy should supplement the uh, requirement. And the as far as the Tata Trust is concerned, we have a specified uh, process wherein we identify the opportunity into different scale, like uh, scale of operations. It should have the uh, large scale kind of uh, impact to the communities where we serve for the improvement of the quality of life and the measurable impact, uh, finite exit route also, because we cannot be the permanent or kind of uh, only the source of uh, uh, supporting that kind of initiative. And adoption and uh, learning best global practices from wherever that is available, we should bring it to the uh, communities so that their quality of life gets improved. Uh, let me ask you, uh, is the, clearly you have a lot of expertise on the ground with Tata Trust. You know what the people need, you know what, the, uh, what is lacking, uh, if you will, in so many aspects. Is government seeking advice from you? Yeah, 100%. We uh, um, closely work with the government. Many of the uh, interventions where government thinks that it wants to do it, but it doesn't have the uh, kind of a first mover kind of a starter where, because if there is a failure happens, the government, uh, there will be a lot of uh, issues coming up. So looking at that kind of uh, issues, uh, we support the government wherever possible. We become a partners with various, there are around uh, more than 25 plus states are there in India. So each state government, as well as the Union of India, we have a, a multilateral kind of a memorandum of understandings where we uh, try to support, uh, supplement the interventions. Like, uh, for example, yesterday, Joseph was talking about the toilet construction happened in India. So the toilet construction almost uh, last of four years of the government period, nine crore toilets have been constructed, nine crore, 90 million. So these 90 million kind of uh, toilets have been done with the support of uh, Tata Trust. Because we uh, kept one of each resource, talented young fellows, in respect to government departments to push this kind of idea of the government. And similarly, in the nutrition side, there are a lot of malnutrition is taking place. So to avoid, uh, to remove that kind of uh, issue, we keep uh, our own uh, uh, kind of uh, resources and try to persuade or continuously monitor that kind of a uh, target has been achieved. So there are many aspects. If I uh, start writing down those kind of uh, uh, involvement, uh, there will be end, uh, yeah. there's no end to it. No, <laughs> we'll be here until tomorrow, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, which is not a bad day, additional day in roads, we'll take it. But, but Tata Trust's uh, work, of course, is, is indeed uh, well exemplified and well documented. Thank you for that, Ruben. But, the role of, of philanthropy, uh, in your opinion, um, yeah. you've been practicing it, you've been observing it uh, for many decades. Uh, how would you define it? Uh, thank you, Leo. It's a great question, and um, I will try to be structured and speak slowly. I think it's 12 points I want to mention for all audience, and uh, I think the number one, which is, I think, very important for all of us to understand, most of us who are sitting in this uh, room today is um, in age of uh, 40 years and uh, older. But the new generation is growing with the absolute new reality. Consumer 
society, what we've been living after the Second World War is over. The purpose of the life becoming a very key element of the success for the new generation. They are not want to do just business, they want to do business with purpose. I think it's a very important transformation from going from consumer society to the sharing economy, sharing living, sharing whatever, co-working, you know. It's people want to have a meaning of life. This is why philanthropy becoming not anymore like I'm doing business here, I'm doing philanthropy here. It's becoming more and more combined. The second point I think is very important, what I want to emphasize, it's um, philanthropy is a very emotional thing. It's uh, alone, isolated, and people, most of people doing emotion and no result oriented. I, I'm the advisory board member of the Impact 46 institution. We analyzed 5,000 top NGOs worldwide. 82% of them didn't have a, a goals or clear goals that they can uh, declare an external. It's why it's a grant eater, the new type of the operational, uh, going by operation for no result, but operation for operation is one of the key challenges of philanthropy. So philanthropy unavoidably become more professionalized and more result oriented. And one of the challenges, of course, how you measure. Because one of the key challenges of philanthropy is usually is time gap. I'm former investment banker. If you look at today's any financial instrument, it's absolute maximum 10 years, except the pension funds money, which cannot be go to philanthropy or social impact or emerging markets, or private family money, which is really can be become very important element of the future of the philanthropy in the world wide. But most of the other is a bond issuing or doing private equity, which is all 10 years. Philanthropy, social impact effect is a one generation, 25 years. So we have a gap between 10 years of the financial instruments and 25 years of the results. And more importantly, you cannot do a measure, measure result because there's no social units we can, without some way measuring what you're doing is affected or not, it's really a big challenge for philanthropy. The next point I want to say about the state. We have all this illusion that the state is playing a key important role. If you look at the history, the state before the last 20 years was not involved in the social, any uh, responsibilities for education or for the uh, health care. It was just 20 years when the, the Industrial Revolution happened, the state became more involved in this whole process. And by the way, I want to remind everybody, 1945 was only 74 states, which means the states, an illusion of the state can know how to do it, and state know what needs to be done. A state have a, by the way, most of the people elected by five years, very short term, is why the doing this really long term philanthropic significant project is not just only with the state, but the network becoming very important. The next point about, um, I think it's important, about the, we're talking about philanthropy, usually about Africa. Of course, but let's look at what happened in Russia or United States. 28% kids have no breakfast going to the state schools. And we're talking about philanthropy everywhere. It's not only, it's a, we always look like it's only in the developing world we need to have. Philanthropy needs everywhere, including developed world needs to be get also, philanthropy is very important. Um, diaspora, I will say network, one of our slogans, what we are saying, we are not a think tank, we're not a philanthropy. We are, we are institutional social impact investment, but doing think to connect, think to create, and think to act. You need to network becoming very important. Diaspora will play a very important role for 21st century because of the, they don't, now we're paying remittance and most of the Armenians getting $2 billion remittance money from the uh, people who live outside of Armenia. But this money is eating the toilet, I'm sorry to say. It's people not investing this money. They're just using for weddings, uh, funerals. It's not really making the transformation of the, in the society. And um, uh, last but not least about compliance and uh, regulations. I think it's becoming tougher and tougher. But I agree with John with the transparency and about the NGOs overall, how NGOs were used and what becoming more critical. How you can do international philanthropy becoming a very interesting uh, challenge because it's more and more regulations coming. This is why it definitely we see the more compliance, more pressure about the transparency. We'll see more result-oriented uh, requirements from, I mean, member of the Co-Impact Network, which Bill Gates and other foundation, how to make scalability infrastructure more efficient and how to measure results will become critical. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this very comprehensive list of what in your mind entails philanthropy in the 21st century, both the role but also the many challenges that philanthropy is changing. Interestingly enough, the one point I thought was uh, you can no longer separate the business from the philanthropy aspect. Both have to go hand in hand and be as result-driven as your business is. Uh, and I think you have, along with your four co-speakers, you have given us a lot of food for thought. Uh, the food for thought that I would now like to pass on to you around the table. Let's open up the discussion for any comments, questions uh, you might have. I'm sure there are quite a few. We have a packed room here. Alphonse, go right ahead. Um, 
Good morning. I'm Alphonse, Member of Parliament, India. I was a for former Tourism Minister of India just two, three months back. Um, I'm so happy to see so many people with their heart in the right place early in the morning. Congratulations for what you're doing. Uh, one of the things which we found in India was there was a whole lot of talk up in the corporate sector about philanthropy, around discussion tables, seminars, but actual money wasn't coming in. So this is where the government intervened, and we had, of course, pioneering people like Tata Trust. What they're doing is phenomenal work. I don't know how much he's been able to really put across, what they're doing is phenomenal work. But we haven't had money coming from the corporate sector at all. So we introduced the legislation uh, three years back saying that you need to put in 3% of your profits into the corporate sector, into social responsibility, spend the money on philanthropy. Now, some of the companies were not doing it, so this year we also introduced a legislation a few months back saying, if you don't do that, it will be a criminal offense. Of course, there's a massive fear <laughs> on the media, so now we kept that thing in abeyance, but we are ensuring that there is a social commitment. I mean, Gandhi said, you are only a trustee of people's money, and therefore you have a responsibility. So we've introduced a CSR concept, compulsory for every company to spend 3%. Now, I don't know what's the view of people around here. I think this is a fantastic thing to do, and I think this possibly could be a model which could be replicated around the world. I don't know what's your opinion of other people here. Thank you, thank you, Alphonse. Ivor, did you want to jump in here? I know you're reaching to, but sir. I, I'm, I'm seriously impressed. I think that that is a phenomenal initiative on the part of the Indian government. It's also probably an admission by the Indian government that they can't deal with all the, these things themselves, and it's remarkable. So just to give everybody a reality check, every dollar that goes into my foundation, I pay tax on in South Africa. The South African government taxes me for my contribution to our foundation. So there is a structural problem around the world. And I think that if India is able to take the lead, let's tell the world about it, because I'd love to see some changes where I live. Please, go right ahead. Please introduce yourself. I'm Rupert Strachwitz from the Messinata Foundation in Berlin, which is a think tank on civil society and philanthropy. And I have a question that follows up on the very in impressive um, short presentations, and for anyone who wants to pick it up, there's been quite a lot of criticism in recent years, usually based on sort of mega philanthropic institutions of the Bill and Melinda Gates type and these kind of um, things, that foundations and philanthropic institutions are becoming too influential, that they are disrupting the ordinary sort of process of government, etc. How would you react to these kind of uh, critical uh, remarks. Who, who here wants to take that uh, about uh, organizations actually becoming too powerful and uh, if I understand correctly even being accused of interfering in government's work. Jean Yvier, do you want, you want to take that? Uh, I think po getting powerful is a result of what you are doing. If you are doing nothing you won't be powerful. You start to be powerful when you start to prove is that you are, you are adding something to uh, non-existing things. So uh, it's, and being powerful doesn't mean that you can impose your power to the other. The only thing is that listen, you, you might only be able to pass a message uh, or to influence or trying to influence uh, people and, and government. So I don't think it's a negative thing. I think that powerful, being powerful is an evidence of your ability to prove something. Ruben? Uh, you know, we are in Greece and we're living a very interesting time because it's um, like a circle. We're coming back to the ancient time. I want to remind everybody that there's always been institutions and networks. It was been always square and tower. I don't know how many of you read the book of Neil Ferguson. It's um, <clears throat> two ma models which always been coherently exist. For example, the ancient time, the Greek polices, small towns which fighting against the Persian Empire and become network, right? Why I'm saying about this, because 
we are worried about the Facebook controlling too much information. We are worried about the transnational corporation control the oil and gas. We worry about these institutions and um, uh, can become more influential in the state. The other point, the main assets, main 21st key asset is a human. And they can travel everywhere they want to. For example, the the person who's been born in Russia can have a British passport to study in America, work in Singapore, and which country control him is why the brain drain, which is key element of the future success of them, will become a key fight area of the everybody. We'll try to get the best people and keep them. So by for organizing philanthropy, becoming more and more influential, not because only of the money, but also the purpose and the meaning becoming so critical for the this bright people. So why we're living in the 21st century where network becoming very critical, whereas the role of state will change dramatically because industrial society is over and the state role will become differently. Doesn't mean that it will not exist, but it will become different. And the in, in, in importance of the collegial network uh, organization, doesn't matter how you name it, will become more and more, more and more important. How it was, by the way, thousands of years when it was the state was not so uh, strong. Pavitra, has Tata Trust ever been accused of becoming too influential, too powerful? So, i just like to add, um, Power uh, assuming is a dangerous phenomenon. We always feel taking uh, the power, whatever is there, it should come through respect. We are governed by the charter. Our main motto of uh, philanthropy is to serve the community and not to attain or gain the power. Uh, that role and that a kind of a space need to be segregated. We need to focus on what we are the best and come out of it and give space for the others to play in their own way. So that's why, uh, because otherwise, if you see uh, last 150 years, we would not have been serving the society. So the remarkable kind of a journey, whatever we have achieved, is through coexistence. And let we live and let others also live and give respect to the ideas and then whatever uh, uh, that kind of uh, other stakeholder is having in his mind. Everyone has to uh, contribute to the upliftment of the society. That's where we... And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation indeed has been uh, viewed rather critically, suspiciously by some saying it is becoming too powerful. Is that an accusation, Ivor, that your family foundation has been facing? So we see three kinds of philanthropy in Africa. We find, we see philanthropists who talk a lot and do very little, and they never get criticized. They are celebrated for the fact that their heart is in the right place, never get criticized. Then you see philanthropists like Bill and Melinda Gates who identify key issues that affect the lives of millions of people. They roll up their sleeves, they get the job done, they bulldoze everybody out of the way to get the job done, and they get criticized. Why do they get criticized? Because they show everybody else up. I am very happy that they are accused of being powerful and it's a huge, huge sign of respect that they are. And I want to see more philanthropists active in Africa with that approach. And there are several. There are some great organizations that do some amazing things and they are accused of being bulldozers. But when that's what you need to do to get the job done to save lives, I don't care. But then there's a third kind of philanthropy, which is very problematic and does fall into the category you've just described. There are think tanks, there are organizations, specifically in Europe and the United States, who use philanthropy in Africa specifically, and I'm sure elsewhere in the world, I'm aware of activities in Europe and elsewhere, as a front for political interference. And that is a problem. So philanthropy, thin veil, to impose radical ideas, to to, to uh, interfere politically, create regime change, often for other nefarious purposes. And that's a problem. It gives philanthropy a, a very, very bad name. So in the context of Bill and Melinda Gates, power to them. I want to see more like that. Well, quite passionate indeed. Uh, uh, we have a gentleman right there. Go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Um, hi, good morning. My name is Simon Allison. I'm a journalist with the Mail and Guardian newspaper in South Africa. Um, I've got two quick questions. My first is for Mr. Olivier. Um, in May, there was an investigation by the UK outfit Finance Uncovered, which suggested that the Brazzaville, the Brazzaville Foundation was 
established as a front um, to launder the reputation of Denis Sassoon Gueso, the president of the, the Republic of Congo. I'm just interested in, in your reaction to that. Um, the second question is for Mr. Ichikovitz. Um, Mr. Ichikovitz, in earlier this year, your company Paramount signed a deal with Saudi Arabia. Um, I'm not sure what the exact nature of that deal is, but this was in the wake of the Jamal Khashoggi murder and documented abuses by the Saudi Arabian military in Yemen. And just wondered how you square that with your philanthropic activity. All right, thank you so much. John, you... We all know where the Melon Guardian stands. Uh, yes, there was an investigation, but I think there has been a report by this so-called NGO, which is in fact a private company, and probably financed by some people who uh, don't like us. Uh, and the conclusion is not proven anything. But I will go further. When you are doing good things, why should you be accused of helping or supporting these people or these other people? At the moment, you are delivering good, efficient things for the country or the African or the world. Even if I was, which is not the case, a supporter of somebody who may appear in your own eyes as bad, why should, not do, should I stop to do what I am doing? If I am doing bad things, I would accept your comments and I would accept what you are saying. But in that case, the foundation, Brazzaville Foundation, is not only supporting or helping people, is they are also proving, proved that we are doing efficient work, we are saving life. So uh, uh, why do you identify one person in, uh, and especially with nothing to do with my company, with my uh, uh, institution? Why would you me to say it in public, in front of you, that I am supporting this guy? I am not supporting this guy. He's a friend. He's a friend. I have to have the right to have friends. But look at what I am delivering, not what my friends are, or in your own eyes. Ivor, you, you were also addressed. I have the privilege to be involved with 22 companies around the world. These companies have lives of their own, and they employ tens of thousands of people. We have a long history relationship between South Africa and Saudi Arabia. And the very contract that you refer to is uh, an industrial collaboration agreement, an industrial contract um, that produces, that will produce thousands of jobs in both countries. It has nothing to do with our philanthropic activities. And quite frankly, I think that in the current global environment, it's very difficult to have a knee-jerk reaction to the relationships you have. You could argue that we do business in the United States, and there are many things going on in the United States from a human rights and other um, abuse perspective that I don't necessarily agree with. I also do business in South Africa, and frankly, I don't agree with what the South African government's doing either. So business, philanthropy are related because the money for philanthropy comes from business. But we do social impact business, we create jobs, and I don't think we have to answer for the countries that we do business with. More questions, ladies and gentlemen, more remarks? Yes, please, all the way up. Ali. Yes, go ahead, please, and then the lady. Go ahead, you're up first, and then the lady all the way in the back. Please introduce yourself. Uh, I can speak uh, Russian. Very well, yeah, yeah, translated. I, I will try to speak English, but I don't know if I can explain myself good here. It seems your English is quite good. I, I think we'll understand you. Go ahead, uh, give it a try. There is uh, more uh, thousand uh, students graduate from um, Armenian universities in Israel. It's most of the uh, graduates is Arab. If you can, uh, Gaspardine Aurora, uh, but, uh, help uh, these students uh, graduate uh, medicine to uh, 
be uh, doctors because Israel uh, didn't allow to these uh, students who finish the University of Armenia to be to work in Israel. Why? Because uh, I want to speak about the experience of uh, Eugene Africa, uh, Africa, South Africa. Uh, because we live in Israel, uh, Palestinian, Arab in Israel, like the situation of Africa, African say, in South Africa. So the question I there is to Ruben. The question that there is more uh, relationship between the state interests and the uh, foundation of all uh, uh, foundation in the world. Uh, French or German or because uh, the Palestinian people now living uh, but uh, control of the this foundation and we didn't uh, can be free uh, get freedom and uh, Palestinian state uh, many times and uh, 25 years from Oslo to now the foundation of French America uh, NATO well, let's give Ruben a chance. It's a let's give him an opportunity to respond. It's political interest. Right. Thank you. I will be very short. It's not our task because it's a state standard that needs to be delivered by Armenian state providing some standards for education. And we all know, unfortunately, education becomes also commodity and sometimes fake. We have a lot of diplomas which was not provided knowledge. But again, it's a very important challenge to get education access to anyone in the world, including Arabs. And I hope Armenia can be a good place for education. Because we have American University, French University, Russian University. But I'm not involved in uh, providing the uh, type of the standards which the Ar Armenian state is uh, established. Ma'am, you have the word all the way in the uh, back. Go ahead. To help, left. Right. right, excuse me. Can, can we move on? There are a couple more questions that have questions. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Marwa Al Daly. Uh, I come from Egypt. I um, I founded and I chair a community foundation in Egypt, and I teach nonprofit management um, at, the, at the university. Um, and also, I'm an Ashoka fellow, so I just want to to share with you something that Bill Drayton, the founder of Ashoka, said that uh, speaking about change in social entrepreneurship, that a social entrepreneur will not give someone a fish, uh, and it will not also give someone, uh, teach someone how to fish. Uh, an entrepreneur would only relax when he or she changes the whole fishing industry. And when you were talking, uh, food for thought, I was thinking, is, is the concept of social entrepreneurship, having a business model for anything that we are involved in, is this the trade for philanthropy now? Um, are, 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 we, are we satisfied by, by, by only serving the lucky few who are making use of our philanthropies? Um, or do we want to scale it up so that, for example, you would change the tax law in, in South Africa, for example, uh, as part and parcel of what you're doing to have a real effect? Uh, 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 otherwise, the effect is really limited, uh, even if we have a business uh, model. And is the concept of social entrepreneurship substituting the concept of uh, philanthropy, philanthropists, only by having this idea of business model? So a lot of questions uh, for... Indeed, uh, quite, quite a number of questions that I will throw back to my uh, esteemed panelist, uh, Pavitra. Which, which one of those you want to tackle? Yeah, uh, as I said earlier, there is, uh, philanthropy is a continuous evolving process. So you can, how to have a open-minded and ready to look at the opportunities that exist in the society to serve the society. So similarly, in Trata Trust side also, and the a creation of the social entrepreneurs is one of the major uh, uh, line of uh, activity, wherein uh, we created a separate entity fully focused on creation of this kind of a social entrepreneurs called Social Alpha. So it is ba based out of the Bangalore, which is an IT hub over there. So they uh, continuously engage with uh, young technocrats who come up with uh, some new kind of uh, thoughts and ideas which can be promoted. So these uh, entity will invest in their uh, kind of uh, thoughts and 
create it has to have a, a basic uh, kind of hygiene wherein it should create a social impact it should have a, a kind of a sustainable kind of a services and it creates employment for the communities so this this way we have one simple example also i can share uh, there is a mri scanning machine which has been uh, available in the market with a very huge cost which has been uh, um, being uh, reinvented and redone and technologically the young technocrats came back from us they were working uh, studying in uh, mit and started developing in their own uh, way of doing things so we invested in them and they are, now that prototype is available they are much cheaper mobile which is kind of a thing which never been uh, uh, thought about it thank you pavidre ivi let me bring you in here um some of the questions i'm sure you have answers for okay so uh it, with our organization uh the first one is we we do the susilo institute in which we uh, work together with the uh, university like uh, boston university as well as the tsinghua university in which we are preparing the next generation um of of students uh, with uh, the right uh, values that is derived from the east and the west um on the other side on the business side that uh, we are doing uh, we deal a lot with the fishermen as well as the agriculture uh, products so um in the areas where we uh, buy the raw materials uh, from we actually do a lot of uh, csr on the ground basically we teach them on how to um um basically uh, have a better yield of the crops and uh the uh, we introduce them the new technology in which uh, uh, give them a better uh, yield uh, in terms of the uh, number of um um um, um tonnage that is uh, basically uh, uh produce so um and we uh, we sort of like uh, make a cooperation in which we we will be the off taker of the of the products to make sure that the price is stable as opposed to you know as a farmers when you when you uh plant something you need to uh, have an assurance that somebody will buy the uh, the product at the right price basically so that's where <clears throat> that's where we come from in terms of the uh, philanthropy in our uh grounds thank you we uh Ivor, did you did you want to address one of the questions yeah an uh, interesting point the concept of uh, social entrepreneurship um uh, sorry um the 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 concept of of corporate social re responsibility overtaking uh um philanthropy isn't it exactly the same thing i think that the that the concept of organizations um building contribution to their communities and to their societies into their business plans is part of the new world order it's part of what's necessary all over the world whether it's in europe or or the united states or in russia or in south africa companies have to be responsible for their for for their immediate environment and the people in the societies in which they live and i think that that it's a natural progression i think that philanthropy in the traditional term existed in the absence of corporations understanding the necessity of their role and i think that the two can can coexist uh um very effectively and i'm i'm very excited by the fact that corporate social responsibility is being built into business plans of organizations all over the world and we definitely seeing the impact of that in africa one final question uh yes go right ahead maybe comment uh may as long as, as, long as it's short, short it's, it's short fine comment. yes uh phd in sociology russia tom state university uh i want to say about charity i am involved now in many uh, projects uh, for example many ethnic diasporas in russia who uh try to help uh, to learn uh, russian language for example or uh, adapt uh, to update uh, migrants from central asia and so on and uh every day i hear one thing uh, give me money and i make a great deal i make a charity great charity and i think and i have a optimistic thesis that uh, if you have real uh, good uh, project you really find money for them 
because many people are sleeping <laughs> now. <laughs> many businessmen sleep, uh, sleep, uh, sleep. And uh, if you uh, go to some uh, businessman and uh, say him, please give money, it's a real problem. Uh, you always can find money for that, for this project. All right, th thank you so much. We're about to wrap up, but I want to do one final, very quick round here, get you all in once more. John, if Olivier, if somebody were to come to you and say, I want to do philanthropic work, uh, wh what kind of advice, as someone who's been at the forefront of such work, uh, what kind of advice would you give that person? You know, uh, I was very surprised uh, because uh, at a certain moment there was a position opened for my office in London, uh, my charity uh, organization in London. And we, we, on the net, on the social media, we informed some of the people that uh, we were open for positions. We received something like 2,500 requests to come to London. So there is definitely, and we have to accept it, the fact that especially the youth are looking at philanthropic organizations as a way to expo uh, express themselves and give something to the world. So even if it was only that, the fact that philanthropic organizations hide young, dynamic, enthusiastic people and give them the possibility to, to open their eyes to the difficulties of this world, I think there is a very nice position. So if I have to, to say, if I would recommend, unless you are, you, your parents have been very rich and you have inherited a lot of money, first start to work with another philanthropic organizations, learn how it works, and then with a little bit of help, you can open your own philanthropic uh, society, company or society. Pavitra, I'm sure many people come to you and to Tata Trust and want to learn from uh, your success model. What, what do you tell them? Yeah, we, uh, we generally scout for the talent and um, continuously when we look at it and we create opportunities also to the young fellows. We have a young fellowship program running across uh, various uh, themes, health, nutrition, was sanitation, everywhere. And uh, we have a 450 plus uh, partners on ground working on various implementations across the country. And uh, we have uh, international partners as well. Every section of the community, we scout for the opportunities where we can bring the best talent and which is uh, best suitable for the community. But what and kind of advice would you give someone who wants to do, uh, wants to get into your line of work, who would say, you've done well, I want to get, do the same thing. Give me your, give me your advice here. Yeah. yeah, so first, uh, I agree with uh, my colleague, uh, what he said. It needs to be first groomed. We need to understand, uh, once you spend some time as an young fellow, are uh, uh, kind of a, some stinked in the social sector, then you are free to understand the complexities in, involved. Because many people feel business is only one where you will have a complexities. But uh, the philanthropy also has its own uh, uh, pros and cons, which you need to understand. If you understand better, then you will be able to serve better to the community. What are the biggest cons? Cons is uh, you will continuously, patience is required. You have to wait for the uh, opportunity and you have to try, try, try until you succeed. Iwi, you got to try until you succeed. You have got to have patience in this business, says Pavitra, uh, the SECA group. Uh, what, what advice would you give uh, to someone who wants to do philanthropic work? Um, I think I agree with uh, uh, either Ruben. I think he, he said that uh, philanthropy is it's really something personal, right? So I think find your find a cause that is really dear to your heart, and and I I, I believe uh, you will find your way there. What is the biggest difficulties that people overlook in in the context of philanthropy? So one of the things that we did in our fam uh, in 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 our uh, CSR program is is teaching the fishermen on how to use the passive um, uh, catching uh, device as opposed to active uh, catching device. So, so the biggest problem is that we are introducing a device that will be less productive than what they are using now, but it is more um, 
um, better in terms of the environmental impact. So as of now, we have a mix, um, we have a mixed results. We succeed in, in places where uh, the people, the fishermen are not dependent uh, solely on the, on the fishery uh, products. So they have agriculture as well. But in the places where uh, it's actually, uh, they're really fully dependent on the fish, fishing result itself, we are seeing a negative result on that one. Ivor, what, what kind of words of wisdom do you have for those who say your, your foundation, the Ishikovitz Family Foundation, has done well, it's an example, it's a role model. I want to I follow those footsteps. What do you tell them? Be results orientated. Philanthropy is highly emotional. A lot of people get involved in philanthropy for the right reasons, but when they get on the ground, it becomes about the work. It doesn't become about the outcome. And what we've learned over time is start with a very clear set of achievable results. Put your passion, put your energy into achieving those results. Be a bulldozer if you have to. And then measure the results and the impact afterwards, not only in money terms, but in the number of lives that what you're doing actually touches. What is the biggest misconception people have of philanthropy, not just in the African context, worldwide? There are many misconceptions, but I think that the biggest misconception is that philanthropy is about getting stuff done. It's not about doing stuff that doesn't have a result. And I, I see a lot of philanthropic organizations around the world who are hugely successful in raising immense amounts of money. And the biggest misconception is that that money actually lands up doing the work that it was raised for. And I think that that has hurt the concept of philanthropy all over the world and has created an industry. There are many, many NGOs who turn over hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, and don't get the job done on the ground because they become massive corporations. And the perception that that money, that the, the housewife in middle America who donates her $10 a month to alleviating poverty in Mozambique, the fact that she actually believes that her $10 is actually alleviating poverty in, in, in Mozambique is a huge misconception because probably only $1 of her $10 actually gets onto the ground. And that's, for me, a huge problem. Ruben, let's round up and close up this uh, very, very interesting panel, philanthropy, something which I'm sure many people come to you uh, for advice, uh, for your piece of uh, thoughts. What do you tell them? Uh, thank you, Ali. I think it was a great session, and um, I hope it will be helpful for our audience to get out of this meeting to some interesting thoughts. I want to share with you it's off the records, or it's a, it will be go public. This uh, is a session I want to share with you. The Mail and Guardian is in the house. It's going public. <laughs> I know what's the rules. Maybe he's sitting in you know, Chatham House uh, rules. Uh, we did a survey. I will not describe everything in detail. We did a survey of why people are doing philanthropy, and it was interesting results. And I will go. Back, I will come back about what the result. But I think the key problem what you ask is uh, distrust. Because we are living in a capitalism a world where is the measurement is coming about how much money you're making and no other criteria, people have a very big suspicion why you're doing philanthropy. Why you're doing philanthropy from state point of view, how maybe you're trying to take the power from the people who survive a mood saying, why you're rich, you're doing this money, something you want to get from me. People have no trust to the people who are doing good things because it uh, looks like not normal. We even found this information, we said, okay, strange, why it's happening? And we did the survey. What we found is, it was very interesting. We found the seven reasons why people are doing philanthropy. And you found why it's a so big problem for philanthropy industry to become more result-oriented and professionalized. I will not go by numbers, because we don't have a time, but I will give you seven points why people are doing philanthropy. And you will be surprised a little bit. The first, again, I'm not going first by numbers, but just the first, because it's emotional. My mother was in this hospital, and it doesn't matter if hospital need or not MRI, I will give his hospital money because my mother was. It's emotional attachment. The second, uh, I want to be a club member. Uh, it doesn't matter if Harvard doesn't need more money, I will give the Harvard more money because I want the club member. It's not about helping education. It's, a, it's a really doing the more to be a club member. The third, I'm feeling guilty. I'm rich, the other is poor. poor. It's a guiltiness. Uh, the four is a religion, and it's the biggest, continued number one by far, 
uh, by number of money which people provide, but the religion is also, I want to be secure whether something exists after I pass away, it's better to be sure, or because people believe it's a value, so I don't want to joke about this very important element for many people. But overall, it's not about result, about something which we're talking about is emotions, mm -hmm. about the membership, about the fifth is a deal, tax deal, JR deal, whatever, the deal with people make, they're getting some special treatments, why it's a commercial, but it's not about the result of the philanthropy, it's more about how you can benefit. Uh, the sixth is a uh, fashion. You need to go and eat dinner and talk about this with your uh, wives sitting around at the dinner saying, oh yeah, we also have some philanthropy, my wife or my kids involved, and it's uh, some part of the subject of discussion. I'm a little bit exaggerating by purpose, but just saying it's, uh, you can see the six main drivers is 93% of money going because of these reasons. We're mm -hmm. all about not result oriented. That's why you have a problem with both donors and receivers NGOs have no interest to make this all professional, transparent, and systematic because it's a no drivers who push people to do this by result, more about emotions and some other things. And only number seven is uh, strategic people see because it's important to make strategic transformation or changes, but it's a very small percentage. That's why I will say the key challenge for philanthropy industry, and I will give advice, first be honest to yourself why you're doing this, and second, uh, be ready, it would be, nobody will trust you, what you're doing is for a good purpose. Thank you so much, Ruben. The motivation why people get engaged in philanthropy, very interesting uh, uh, results and numbers that you put forth, uh, many of them emotion, if not even vanity driven, but at the end of the day, and this is something that all of you have reiterated, uh, Ivor, more than anyone, is that it's about getting the job done, it's about getting results at the end of the day, otherwise, philanthropic work is, is moot, is, is uh, pointless uh, to the degree. But all of you, of course, have been at the forefront of this, uh, of this movement, uh, of this engagement, and uh, thank you so much to everyone here in the audience for your active participation, making this a very lively session on the second day in the morning. I know it's always a challenging one, but I think this has been one that uh, sort of sets the tone and uh, drives us throughout the next uh, 24 hours. Ruben Vardanyan, John Yves Olivier, Ivor Ishikovic, Ivi Sumbada, and Pavitra Kumar, thank you so much. This is your applause. Thank you.